Uh, this is my first year at DOD. Thank you for having me. So the topic I'm talking today is uh, the young China. Um, um, when I think about young China, there's uh, one of my very favorite novel. It's called uh, A Tale of Two Cities. It opens the first chapter like this. It was the best of the times. It was the worst of the times. It was the edge of wisdom. It was the edge of foolishness. It was a sense of light. It was a season of darkness. It was a spring of hope. And it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. I think it as well vividly describes the era of China right now and how generally the young generation feel about the environment surrounding us. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. As a nation with more than 5,000 years of history and heritage, yet China only has had about 35 years of a real sense economic development since uh, 1978 where the Communist Party of China made the decision to launch a nationwide reform and opening up campaign. And only from there, the modern China, no one... Oh, I remember I have a, I have a PPT. So, um, where the modern China, known as the Communist Party, took the leadership for the very first time allowed the existing of uh, the private sector in economy. So what has happened for the 35 years, for the past 35 years, and what are the real stories of China, and how they have shaped the young generation of China? For the past 35 years, with the average annual growth, GDP growth of 9.8%, China has become the world's second largest economy in 2011, three years ago. And according to the World Economy Forum, um, global Gender Outlook 2014, the Chinese have the lowest rate on the economic unsatisfaction and the highest rate on the economic confidence. However, at the same time, the social unrestfulness has also taken place during the rapid economic transformation. Extreme disparity between the rich and the poor is one of the major issues faced by the society. Firstly, who are the young generation of China? Generally speaking, they are the generation born after 1978. Described by the Western media, this is a generation growing up under the impact of the internet and the globalization, or so-called westernization. As a Chinese born in the year of 1986, I can tell you this is not the case. I use a computer for, my, for the very first time at the age of 14. Had my very first cup of coffee at the age of 15 and spoke my very first sentence in English at the age of 17. But of course, this is not the case for a very small group of political elite. Many, many of them have grown up in the West and adopt a Western lifestyle at a very early young age. In fact, there are one princeling I know of that who only learned that the airplane was supposed to be shared with other passengers at the year of 13. Reason being, she was traveling, flew with her grandfather, a vice premier of China at that time at a private jet during her entire childhood. By the way, for those who are not familiar with the term princeling, this is used to label the children of China's state leaders starting from the vice premier level and above. As a normal kid, of course, myself, we have grown up under the intensive educational competition where the school on examination determines one's future. We have grown up in a very still traditional Chinese culture-oriented environment where we value polite malism, order, and seniority. Growing up in a social norm where su success equals to money and the wealth. 
and also because of the rise of the power for the private sector. Being a business person, perhaps for the very first time in Chinese history, surpassed be being becoming a government official as a preferable career choice. Additionally, somewhere along the line, studying abroad and having a sense of the civilized Western lifestyle was a dream to almost every young Chinese back then during our teenage years. The first generation of China, the first generation of Chinese entrepreneurs is my father's generation, who were around 20 to 25 years old during the open up reform. More than 90% of China's increasing economic wealth for the past 35 years was created by no one but them. They are also the first generation redefining the social class because before them, except for the very small group of political elite, everyone was equal financially, while in another world, in, in another word, equally poor. I will share my own personal story and the story of my family as a real case of how the young generation, how the first generation of entrepreneurs is. I was born in the mountain, and my father was the first generation after the modern China study abroad. Um, he, at that time, was one of the top Chinese um, engineers working for SOE, what uh, SOE stands for, state-owned enterprise, a nuclear weapon factory. That's why I was born in the mountain. And at the later stage, my parents realized, being in the mountain, I didn't have much opportunity for education. So that's where they decided to move to the big city, with at that time, the total asset of the, of the family, 100 US dollars. Um, and giving up the SOE company, especially the nuclear weapon company, my family was forced to give up uh, the national identity, or what you call hukou at the time, because you were not supposed, at that time, uh, early 90s, you were not supposed to move freely from the city, jump from city to city. That's why I never studied one day in my primary school. I didn't have a chance to go to the regular school. That's how I became a chess player. Uh, I become a chess player myself at the age of uh, nine. And I learned the life in a hard way because uh, my family could have supported me to participate in tournaments at that time. So every time we had to raise more money to buy the train tickets, to pay for the ticket to the tournament. And also, uh, I was traveling China at the, at the age of nine all by myself, um, by sleeping on the, floor, uh, on the floor of the train, to, just to save money. And I remember every time my father would ask me to do a mathematic problem before I, I participated in the tournament, which is adding the, all the train ticket and the cheap hotel and, and the every expenses, how much does one chess move cost? So I guess that's the, my very first lesson in life everything comes with a price. And every, every move in life comes with a responsibility. Of course, um, um, being a young chess player, um, I was fortunate to become the national youngest, um, the, the youngest national champion at the age of the 10, and again at the age of 12. That's how I finally had a thank you. Had, a, had the opportunity to go back to the regular school system at the age of 13 uh, at my middle school. And, and later stage, when I was 17, I was accepted by Columbia University with a full scholarship. Reason is very simple. Uh, Columbia is lack of a, a good chess player. That's why <laughs> I had my opportunity finally to see the world, to see the Western world, the US, New York for the first time. And after my graduation, I, I worked one year in Hong Kong and then later on um, went back to family business, working for the family business, which is in construction, construction machinery and the real estate for the past uh, almost five years. Uh, it's a very masculine 
industry, but I learned to enjoy that. Uh, which at that time my father was already one of the very successful business persons, businessmen in China. So, who are the when we're talking about the young generation of the China? Simply, they are the children of the first generation, like my father. How does that matter? Well, perhaps it doesn't matter much in the society where the social mobility is high. However, in China, the most of the con- and most of the Asia countries, your last name can either open doors for you or shut them down. Given the population of 1.4 billion, you will assume that elite circle in China is large, but in fact, it's extremely tight and hyper interconnected small circle. For last year, as a co-founder, I served as the first chair to China Heritage Club, a small circle of second generation from the leading family business in China, who is committed to conduct business in a more transparent way. And yet, members of China Heritage Club also, in many ways, connect with the second generation of top, polit- uh, top politicians, the princelings. This is an interesting fact that the second generation of princeling, whose their fathers are the founding fathers of modern China, where you can, you, where it's known as Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, those founding fathers. So most of the second generation they choose to become politicians. For example, our new president, President Xi Jinping, is the son of a wise premier. However, the third generation of princelings who are now around my age mostly become business people. If, a, if in a political system like U.S. where business drives politics, they will become more and more, more powerful by generating more wealth. However, in the system of China where it is the other way around. This is how the princeling group will become less and less powerful from moving away the direction of politics. Beside the elite group, here comes the majority of the young generation, the, gra- the grassroots, who are born without a rich father or influential family background. They are like the first generation of entrepreneurs working every possible way to break the societal norm and social class and living under a tremendous financial and social pressure. Some of the China's, some, but, however, some of the China's leading and the most innovative entrepreneurs who are from the grassroots, such as founder, founders of Tencent, Alibaba, and Baidu, and their company's value at the stock exchange market right now all passes 100 billion US dollars. So why is that? It may sound proud, but the first generation is perhaps one of the most, sorry, the, the, but, but first, Chinese is perhaps one of the most hardworking people in the world. And the competition that young generation face is, is furious. Secondly, in our tradition, Chinese feel strongly about honoring the family and living for other family members and collective interest. It endorses a very powerful psychological strength to strive and survive. Last but not least, when you are grassroots and at the at the bottom of the society, the full potential is to be released as being cornered. This is why comparing to the elite, the grassroots is a real drive and a bottom-up force to transform China in the future. So my story goes like this. Last March, I left the family business in Chengdu and start up my own company, KG Inc., with my personal saving of 35,000 US dollar. KG Inc. is an investment management company focusing to build a trusted economy and also the strategic partner to high level APAC events. At the 10th month anniversary of this new company at the end of this month, we have passed a market value of 100 million US dollars. Most importantly, I have never felt this happy. Thank you. In finding a meaning, much more than money making in our business. 
It is the best of our times. It is golden land of, of, of opportunities and hope. As a young generation, I can't ask for more but being born young in China at this time. Thank you.